and give me the thumbs up when we're ready to go. <laughs> Sorry, Lisa, I am um, finishing up. I, I think we are recording now and I'm finishing up putting us on Facebook. So go ahead and you, you're welcome to get started, but I'll, uh, uh, we'll get that going here soon. Thanks, Shannon, and appreciate y'all um, working with us as we get all our technology in order. We want to make sure we capture this in any way we can to share with more people because um, these conversations are so important to our watershed. And we really appreciate y'all um, joining us to have our Watershed Watch chat. Um, this is a production that we started to really engage and focus on issues in the Middle Basin um, with our partners. The work that we all do together depends on partnerships. And so we appreciate um, the opportunity to partner with you all as individuals, as well as organizations. And we'll go ahead and get started next slide with our chat today um, as part of this ongoing series. Shannon, while you're moving the slide forward, I'll go ahead and you're, we're, they're going to have three speakers today. Of course, we will open up a little bit later for um, your questions and conversations. Um, but we're very pleased to have the Public Trust Law Firm for the Environment with us today. John November will be speaking about the work together. Me is your St. John's Riverkeeper and Gabby Melch is our St. John's Riverkeeper Middle Basin Coordinator. So look forward to all the speakers and most importantly, all the work that we're doing together. Next slide. And so as a reminder, or if any of you are new to St. John's Riverkeeper, who we are, um, we are a not-for-profit organization. Our mission is to defend the St. John's River to, and advocate for its protection. And the way we do that is working with citizens just like you, as well as partners. We investigate pollution um, issues. We advocate for um, and seek for solutions. We work with the public on education, on how we can all raise awareness about what we love about the St. John's, how we can engage, but also how we can be involved in the protection of the St. John's River. And today we're happy to partner with the Public Trust and we'll let John introduce the Public Trust. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, my name is John November. I'm executive director and general counsel for the Public Trust. And uh, like Lisa said, um, we've had an opportunity uh, to be the law firm for the environment in Northeast Florida. Most times when you hear of environmental lawyers say, oh, I'm, I'm an environmental lawyer, that generally means they work for developers who are developing the environment. I love to have one of the very few jobs in the world where you get to have one client and that client is the earth and the uh, habitat and people that depend on it for its natural bounty. So uh, we've been doing this since 2005. I've been the executive director since 2016. And uh, I also get to work hand in hand with a great scientist and, and partner in crime, uh, Romy Van, who I think is online today. So we can go on to the next slide. So just real briefly, some of our past successes, we monitor every single point source in Northeast Florida and North Central Florida as well to determine if they're in compliance with their permits. If they're not, we bring Clean Water Act lawsuits to bring them into compliance. Although we do take a very collaborative approach when we can, we're very aware of economic concerns and wanna make sure that we uh, are do everything we can to help everyone's bottom line and protect the environment being the most important thing because that is the foundation for our quality of life and our economy here in, in Florida. Uh, there is a precedent for the Riverkeeper and the Public Trust working together in the past. We worked uh, to, when we are uh, made aware of some issues with sanitary sewer overflows for JEA, there's still problems with this throughout the state. But as a result of some litigation that the Public Trust and the Riverkeeper worked on together, we were able to work with JEA to hire outside consultants and engineers. And now JEA is considered one of the most progressive and one of the most proactive utilities in the state to react to uh, sanitary sewer overflows, including having a whole root cause workshop mo monthly where they can adaptively make things better over time. So uh, we're very proud of that collaboration and we're excited to collaborate with the Riverkeeper moving forward on this project. Lisa? Thanks, John. 
And, and so, as I mentioned, you know, the focus of our, our conversation um, is part of these watershed chats, watch chats is the Middle Basin. Um, of course, we're all connected and specifically regarding our issue today, um, there are significant um, unintended consequences and water quality degradation due to biosolids and sewage sludge that not only impact water quality in the Middle Basin, but also public investment. Um, and so we're going to talk about that today and, and more importantly, what we can do together, because not only is this a threat for the middle part of the St. Johns River in the circle here, it also threatens the entire 310 miles of the St. Johns, um, not to mention other Florida waters that are outside of South Florida. So thank you for tuning in today for this conversation. Next slide. Um, in, in 2019, um, it was one of the worst algae outbreak seasons that we've seen in a while. In fact, there were more than 90 days of green slime on the river. And as we worked through that algae bloom, taking samples, working with the water quality, uh, water, St. John's Water Management District and others, um, the type of algae that was driving that significant outbreak was one that was fueled by phosphorus. Phosphorus is one of the two types of nutrients that fuel these outbreaks. Next slide. And, and unfortunately, it, it was not real surprising. Um, we know, I think you need to click one more time. Um, you know, we, we know that these nutrients um, are not only are they, you know, unsightly, they basically make our waterways unusable. Um, they can cause significant health issues. Um, you, you can have immediate issues with skin irritation as well as they can cause respiratory stress as well as there's long-term impacts that can impact your, your, your liver as well as neurological issues. So it's of high concern, not only from an environmental standpoint, an economic and, 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 and health issue, because um, it makes our waters unusable and it can threaten our health. Next slide. But where are they coming from? Um, we have worked for more than 20 years with our partners on trying to reduce um, urban fertilizer use. You see significant nutrient pollution from urban fertilizer. We do have better ordinances when we started, but that still we need to do more to reduce runoff. Sanitary sewer overflows, as John mentioned, we've seen an improvement in the lower St. John's River, but that's something we're continuing to see too much sewage go into our, our, our waterways that drive that nutrient pollution. Failing septic tanks, specifically in the middle basin is a big issue, getting these septic tanks off our waterways, which are threatening not only the St. John's and surface waters, but also our springs and even animal waste going down the drains. Anything that's going down the drains, our stormwater systems aren't designed to take the pollution out. So it's getting into our waterways. Um, there is a stormwater rulemaking exercise that's going on as we speak. Um, so there'll be legislation we anticipate next year that could improve some of the performance of these systems, but it would take a long time to get them to where they need to be. So we need to make sure we stop pollution at its source. Next slide. Um, and one of the reasons we are so concerned about sewage sludge, you'll see in a minute why this is an issue based on the real si the scientific data. But another concern is this is a new source. This is a new source that's added on top of all the different sources that we've had before. And it's a we are, we're receiving in the St. John's River watershed just upstream from the, um, the middle basin, an unfair, unequitable share of this black slime that is a byproduct from wastewater treatment facilities. Next slide. Um, so let me turn it over to John to, to give you a little bit more detail about what this is, what we're doing, and why it's such a major threat to our waterways. John? Yeah, this might just, kind of, this picture to the left just might kind of look sort of crazy to you guys. Um, and it looks crazy to me too. Essentially the nature of what's happening is, so, is the thing that's so problematic. One community's waste is being dumped on another community's waste. That community happens to be a rural underserved community. And the one doing the dumping happens to be a more urban um, population center in South Florida, Miami, Fort Lauderdale, West Palm Beach where they've decided that they're not gonna dump their waste on their own uh, watersheds, why would we allow them to dump them on ours? And that's the heart of the problem with what's going on right now. And um, just seeing the, the tonnage 
of this stuff that's being dumped mostly around the upper basin of the St. John's is, is pretty alarming. And it's, uh, we know there's other problems, like Lisa said, we know septic tanks are an issue. We know fertilizers are an issue. We know SSOs are an issue, but this is a known source that we can control. And we have a responsibility as a state to do something proactive to change the way we've been doing things. Cause you'll see shortly, things are not going very well. Next slide. So essentially, just a little more information about what this stuff is. Um, we call it sewage sludge. Industry likes to call it biosolids. It's kind of like a greenwashing phrase to make it not sound that bad. Um, industry will tell you that they are using it to grow crops. Um, however, those same uh, folks who are growing those crops are actually getting paid by the utilities and the haulers, the ones that bring the stuff up to central Florida to dump this stuff on their ranch and farmland. After they do this, they cannot use that ranch and farmland to grow food because we know of all the metals and toxins and heavy nutrients that are in this stuff. It's essentially human, human sewage that has not been treated uh, to a high degree. Um, and so there's other ways to get rid of this stuff, incineration, landfill, um, and all those, those aren't great options. I would argue that disposing of these way, ways through traditional disposal practices makes more sense than dumping them in our watersheds and seeing the you know, green slime and the, the waste that's coming off these things. Uh, we went and did a site visit right next to where all these facilities are uh, down kind of near Melbourne and you can see it in the water. You can smell it. Um, it's, it's pretty alarming when you, when you set your own eyes on it. Next slide. So this kind of talks about kind of wh where, where we are on this, where these biosolid sites are happening. And you see this big um, you know, group of them right where that arrow is. Unfortunately, if you can imagine where you see kind of Port St. Lucie, you're not allowed to dump any biosolids sort of there from there south. So guess where the closest place is to go dump the biosolids? Directly right up 95. So it's the cheapest because it's the closest. And unfortunately it's getting a, a inordinate amount of the burden for the entire state as we speak. So um, that's gotta change. Lisa, any other comment on that? I think I'll turn it over to you for this next one. Thanks, John. Um, and we'll come back to that map in a minute in another slide because it, 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 while those, all of those permitted sites are upstream from the middle basin, it all flows downstream. And we're seeing the evidence of that. And, and back to the egregious nature of this is, um, you know, 89% of the sewage sludge that's being disposed of on land in the St. John's River watershed is coming from outside the district. So that means that's them trucking in someone else's pollution, as John mentioned, into our watershed. So that's undermining not only the health of the river, um, but it also is undermining significant public investment. Next slide. Um, and it's only going to get worse. Um, so we're seeing significant increase in population. In fact, we've been saying it's pop our population is growing by 1,000 per day. I heard a new number recently, it's grown up to 1,400 per day. Um, but if you look at the fastest growing areas, Miami-Dade, Broward, Hillsborough, Orange County, these, these are areas that are in those protect, protected zones. And so we're gonna see an increase in South Florida's pollution coming north. And it's basically what happened in 2007, South Florida was given protections because they were seeing so much pollution runoff from sewage sludge into the Everglades. And so while the legislature gave them special protection and that's what transferred all their pollution north. Next slide. <clears throat> so here's a, you can see it here actually based on the phosphorus runoff. Um, so the special protections for South Florida were passed in 2007, but there was a grandfather clause. So there was some time for these permits to run out and what we saw by the time you started seeing these, the grandfather clause run out, there was a 50% increase in how much biosolids is actually being, I'm sorry, how much phosphorus loads were, were being tracked within the St. John's River watershed. And so you can, there's a direct correlation to this significant increase in 
phosphorus, which is fueling these toxic blue green algae blooms to the increase of land um, disposal of sewage sludge within the upper basin. Next slide. Um, so why is that important outside the upper basin? Um, so again, as we mentioned earlier, you can see that there's a, that DEP actually permits, so this is a permitted pollution source, more than 89,000 tons of sewage sludge in those three counties of Indian River County, Brevard, and Osceola. And then just downstream, the middle St. Johns River has a basin management action plan. A basin management action plan is basically a, a plan that sets out to reduce the amount of, of nutrient pollution in that section of the river so there won't be more of these toxic blue-green algae. The state and local governments have spent hundreds of millions trying to meet the goals of that basin management action plan in the middle St. Johns River, but it depends on a reduction of phosphorus in the headwaters. And as we just showed you in the slide before, we're seeing a significant increase. And by the way, if you're, if you're tuning in from the Lower St. Johns River, the Lower St. Johns River Basin Management Plan requires a reduction of phosphorus in the middle basin, which requires a reduction of phosphorus in the headwaters. So basically by permitting this significant amount of phosphorus you know, runoff in the headwaters of the St. Johns, it's undermining these regulatory tools all the way the, through the 310 miles of the St. Johns River. Next slide. And so it's more than just an environmental issue. Um, back when we started working on this with our Headwaters Advisory Council, there was a technical advisory committee put together by the state, which we do appreciate. Um, and we participated in those conversations. Within that conversation, it was presented a formula that not only do you have an annual load of this green slime causing nutrient pollution, you also have an increased cleanup cost liability. So for all of the sewage sludge that's running off into the waterways, there is an annual cleanup cost liability based on an equation done at that committee of up to $200 million annually. And so this isn't a question of if there's a cost to this sewage sludge runoff, it's, a, it's basically, um, it's how much. And a lot of people think that this number is way too low but it's just adding insult to injury because we're not, we haven't kept up with the pollution that's being created within our watershed and they're adding this much to it. Next slide. So let me send it on back to John to talk about some of the incremental improvements that we have seen based on this. Um, I'll be, then we'll talk about why it doesn't go far enough. John? Right. Yeah. So um, this, the entire nature of biosolids and how the, sh the burden has been shifted to North Florida does not get fixed by the rules being proposed in the legislature this session. So both the Senate and the House have begun to ratify a rulemaking process that occurred as a result of the technical advisory committee that met last year over the past two years to develop rule changes to try to uh, fix some of the problems that existed with the current rule. Frankly, the way that biosolids are currently being managed, there's almost zero environmental protection. Uh, there's no balancing between environmental protection and yield. The amount applied is based entirely on the yield that these farmers would like to see based on nitrogen. So you determine the amount of nitrogen you need in order to grow the amount of grass that you want to grow. And then you purely just extrapolate the amount of phosphorus based on that amount of nitrogen. So there's no real protection for phosphorus. And in this freshwater system, generally phosphorus exceedances are the things that cause the algal blooms to occur. So Thankfully, the new rule does restrict phosphorus from sewage slung being applied above the agronomic rate for growing crops. So it's really kind of crazy. You'll see a nutrient management plan currently that states 
we're going to apply this amount of, 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 of nitrogen. And then it says, well, well, the crop need for this particular crop is 40 pounds of P2O5 if, it's, if there's low phosphorus in the soil. Or if there's already high phosphorus in the soil, it'll say there's zero need for phosphorus in this crop. And then you move one box over and on their nutrient management plan, it'll actually say, we're gonna put 320 pounds of P2O5 on this, on this acreage. So there's a disregard for what national biosolids and national groups say that we shouldn't be applying above the agronomic rate. The reality is it's being applied above the agronomic rate across the country. So there's a chance that we actually might go at after this on a federal level to make sure that the federal regulations um, reflect what's happening in Florida right now. There is pending legislation going through right now that ratifies these incremental improvements. Uh, it also has some known loopholes, unfortunately. So this, is, this slide's about the incremental improvements though. Um, something that's really good and makes sense is that they're actually, every year, the nature of phosphorus, and I've been working with UF IFAS on this a lot, is that it builds up. So you can't look at phosphorus in a vacuum. You have to look at it over the course of time. So as you're dumping phosphorus on the field, it actually fills up. So there's no more capacity. There's no more opportunity for the soil to bind up that phosphorus. So once there's no more capacity, that phosphorus we know runs right off. So they're actually gonna start looking at that, doing annual testing every year and adaptively modifying the amount of phosphorus that'll be allowed to be put on these fields over time. And then maybe the most important thing and something that should be happening right this second is we should not be putting this stuff on fields that have high water tables. In other words, where the groundwater's directly next to the surface, because we know almost immediately, the nitrogen is gonna get binded up through a nitrification process, but that phosphorus is gonna make its way directly into the groundwater table and out to our waterways that are already at risk for phosphorus blooms and eutrophication. Um, mm -hmm. The Department of Environmental Protection will say, um, you know, this is gonna draw up, uh, it's gonna cost 310 million uh, to, to continue the, con continue the class B. That's true. It's going to have a huge impact on, on class B operators bottom lines. So unfortunately what that's going to do and, and what we call this in the environmental community is whack-a-mole. It's likely going to limit the amount mm -hmm. of class B dramatically, but what the utilities are going to start doing is treating this stuff to something called double A, which is a higher level of treatment for heavy metals and some other dangerous toxic stuff, but it doesn't affect the fact that the nutrient, um, the nutrients, and that when we talk about that, that's the phosphorus and the nitrogen, the amount of that doesn't really change. It's still, avail it's still available to the environment. And so it's equally harmful, but there's no regulation on class AA currently. Um, the other really big problem with these incremental rule improvements is that it pushes it down the line another two and a half years before they come into effect. So that's absolutely um, unacceptable that that happens. There's other, there's multiple other smaller loopholes in the rule. And if anyone would like to discuss those with me, I'd be happy to um, after this presentation. Uh, next slide. So the legislation is a step in the right direction. It does not fix the problem. And so there are um, two additional approaches that we're taking in order to stop this egregious practice in our watershed. The first one is making sure that we are monitoring and reviewing all upcoming permits and renewals of permits to ensure that they're not applying phosphorus mostly in a way that's going to damage our watersheds even more than they are. The second one, and this is the, the big one, is going after some of these ginormous land application sites in the upper basin right north of the middle basin to challenge their existing permits and say that what they are doing to our watershed by applying the amount of biosolids they're applying has indeed changed the environment so much that it justifies a change to the way that we are managing 
biosolids in central and north Florida along the St. Johns River. Next slide. So uh, fortunately, we've already had a little bit of success in, in the environmental community. I, I feel like even in my life, it, it, sometimes it feels sort of rare. It feels like you're, you're spinning your, your wheels a lot of the time and your advocacy, advocacy is falling on deaf ears. Thankfully, this is not an example of that. Um, last September, Shannon Blankenship sent me an email saying, hey, we have some members of our uh, middle, base, uh, middle and upper basin who are really concerned about Crescent Lake and this new application that we saw for, for sewage sludge. And that was right uh, at the time when when I was digging deep into to biosolids and and the and everything that goes into it. And so um, Crescent Lake is already impaired for phosphorus, guys. So just like Lake Okeechobee, the Caloosahatchee, and St. Lucie that that have these issues with uh, limitations on the amount of phosphorus, Crescent Lake is in the exact same boat. If you look at the little chart at the bottom of the graph, the amount of pounds of total phosphorus that we're going to try to reduce is 58%. So we're trying to reduce the amount of phosphorus in the watershed, yet we're going to permit a site that's going to dump 320 pounds of phosphorus per acre directly next to Crescent Lake. Well, we got on the phone with FDEP leadership and we said, we don't care what the rules say. There's a bigger rule and more overarching rule in the state of Florida that you cannot knowingly degrade a water body. And we thought that this, since this water body was already impaired, this would have been a violation of Florida's anti-degradation policy. Well, it turns out that FDEP agreed with us and the agency began to prepare the most stringent biosolids land application and permit history requiring for the first time a site-specific limitation on P, uh, phosphorus, excuse me. And so that's what the new rule does. Um, but uh, unfortunately, before this stringent permit was finalized, the application applicant decided to pull their permit application. So it did not go into effect. But since our reasoning was successful and we were able to say, hey, this water's impaired, you can't I, you can't intentionally, knowingly further impair it. That's, I believe, going to set precedent for when we bring actions against other entities to say, nope, the, the time has changed. We now know with science that this is a problem. We can't allow this to happen anymore. Next slide. So that's one way, and that's going after permits that are coming up for renewal or are or, or getting newly applied for. We'll keep our eyes on those, certainly. The other thing that we're doing is what I mentioned before, and that's going after some of these big, uh, you know, where they're putting down like 10,000 tons of this stuff every year, just enormous amounts of biosolids, mostly from South Florida into our watershed. And the, the, the thinking behind this, and I know there's a lot of language on this slide, but I wanted to give you guys sort of a little preview of what our legal action might look like to try to get additional uh, uh, relief beyond what the legislator's doing. And that essentially is, if we can show that there's any change in the environment or surrounding conditions, then we can require a vision to conform to applicable water quality standards. And th that word revision, that means a revision to a permit. So right now, um, there is a uh, insane changes in the health of the St. John's River. And so this isn't coming straight from the public trust. Uh, this is coming from three decades of data built out by the St. John's River Water Management District, where their scientists presented to the technical advisory committee that we discussed earlier, who helped come up with the rules to say, there is an environmental change, although we can't you know, directly prove causation yet. They just got two, almost $2 million from FDEP to pay for science to try to prove that causation. The correlations are very, very strong. So Lisa talked earlier about that 2007 rule that created special protections for the Okeechobee Basin. 
It was grandfathered in until 2012. Well, if you look at this map, notice what happens right around 2012. The numbers start creeping up and everything starts moving up, the levels of phosphorus. And the St. John's River Water Management District says when phosphorus levels increase, the number of algal blooms increase. Just in the past couple of years, we've had over 20 reported algal blooms on Lake Washington, which provides the drinking water for the community of Melbourne. So this is a serious, this is a serious issue. Unfortunately, the St. John's River Water Management District has not developed a report on all this data, a comprehensive scientific report that could be used to be peer reviewed by additional scientists to say, state policymakers, there's no wiggle here. There's no doubt. Their correlations are so strong that we have to do something to change the way that we are managing this resource. And so the public trust in collaboration with the Riverkeeper are putting together the science to basically put together this report that the water management district never did. And then we're gonna have peer reviewed scientists so that it's there's no wiggle room that this really isn't a problem. Cause we hear through the grapevine that some do believe that this really isn't a problem. And so we have to quiet those voices and get the type of consensus, not just from the water management district whose voices are already pretty strong, but additional scientists that have the unique and independent voice that can potentially create change. So although this is about the law, it's combining the law with science. And that unique approach, I think, is what's going to set us apart in creating some real change. Next slide. Go ahead, Lisa. Yeah, well, thank you, John, for that. And, and, and as you can see, um, we're, we're thrilled to be partnering with John and the Public Trust and Romy for all the work they have pulling together. Um, you know, existing science that unfortunately has not been used as aggressively as need to be for this conversation. Um, but there are some incremental steps that have been made forward. There is legislation that's going through the system right now. And one of the most important things that we're doing this legislative session is making sure that state policymakers they don't they don't think this is the end game. They understand that while this incremental step is better than what we have today, it does not fix the problem, and it still allows South Florida to truck their sewage sludge north, and along with that, the pollution problems that come with it. So we're focusing our efforts to make sure we fix the discrepancy and the inequities of South Florida pumping, uh, trucking their sewage north and getting a commitment from these elected officials on the record that more will be done because we have to use every legislative tool as well as legal and scientific tool to fix this problem due to the degradation. We also, this is not the only sewage issue we have in the state of Florida. We need to focus on making sure we have a comprehensive oversight and sustainable management of the growing volume of sewage in our state. We live on a peninsula. We have to have a plan that's not, that, that there's currently not one in place. We're playing whack-a-mole with this pollution and that's not gonna protect our state. It's not gonna protect our waterways, waterways long-term. And you know, what do you do with it? Well, there are new technologies and fixes that can either control phosphorus to reduce the amount of pollution runoff as well as to turn sewage, solid, sewage sludge into um, biofuel. So there are technological fixes and innovation, um, but right now the state's not incentivizing those or not investing in those. So we're advocating for that. And then also long-term, um, you know, the other step, once we get class B is um, we are going to see more double A, which is the cleaner yet still nutrient pollution laden fertilizer um, that's not being regulated. And, and that has to be regulated because the concern is is that they're dumping it you know, for land to, for disposal and not using it for agricultural purposes. So these are the advocacy steps we're working on right now to have a discussion with um, the legislation that's moving through the legislature, but we'll continue to have underscoring these needs with science and the law to make sure that we get a sustainable plan moving forward. Next slide. And so with that, uh, I, I will open up the floor for questions. 
Um, and I'll turn, uh, you can raise your hand and, and Shannon will add, um, try to facilitate or you can put something in the chat um, for us to discuss. But really appreciate y'all tuning in and your opportunity um, to discuss, I won't say my favorite subject, but one that's always on my mind and keeps me up at night because it is a new pollution source. So open it up for questions. Yeah, so John and Lisa, great job, great presentation. Um, I love that we can sort of combine a lot of the advocacy work that we have going on with a lot of the legal strategies that the public trust has going on, um, really utilize our, our strengths and, and combine them for what is obviously, and hopefully everyone sees now, a very you know comprehensive uh, uh, issue. Um, John, good job name dropping uh, there in your presentation. That was always nice to uh, 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 sort of you know, wake me up to say, oh, uh, what, <laughs> what did I do? How did I, how did I get involved in this? Um, while we wait to see if anyone, and you know what, actually, I didn't, if anyone did raise their hand, I didn't see you, um, but we did have some questions submitted beforehand. And then if anyone has a, um, something to submit in the chat, you're welcome to. But I wanted to ask, um, uh, how does JEA deal with biosolids? That was a question that we received beforehand. What's the JEA strategy here? Um, so JEA actually, they do dispose a small amount on land. They actually have a permitted site that they dispose of on some of their land. Um, they also, a majority of it, they turn to AA um, into that cleaner fertilizer that goes onto the market and unfortunately is not regulated. Um, we're actually meeting with a new CEO of JEA next week, and that's one of our challenges to them is the technology piece. You know, we need a long-term solution. And wouldn't it be great if JEA could, you know, invest in some of these technologies or work with some of the other utilities across the state to have a longer-term solution? Um, so, so right now they do a combination, but the bulk of their sewage sludge is turned into fertilizer that, that's a little bit cleaner than the sludge we're talking about today. And, and to follow up on that, because we did have a question about the technology and hey, Jim, thanks for joining us. Um, this is your question. Um, but Jim asked, you know, we know that new technology is going to be giving us more solutions in the future, but what should we be doing with biosolids right now? You know, what's the solution? I think that's what all of us want to know because we see the whack-a-mole approach. We see that it's not comprehensive. It's not holistic. And so what is the solution with um, with our waste in the state of Florida or with biosolids that, that we would like to see? I'll take a stab at this one. So if we do nothing, and we allow class B to continue happening and going onto our watersheds, we are knowingly degrading our waters. So that is not the answer. And if there's no change in the way that we do that and no pressure on that, that's the way it's gonna keep on going. So we sort of have to play whack-a-mole, unfortunately. And then we move on to the next phase of trying to fix this problem. So frankly, Incineration and landfilling is the way to go right now, unless we have a, unless we, the um, mm -hmm. applicant of the biosolids on land can affirmatively show that there's no phosphorus pollution entering the environment. And that's the situation in South Florida. So if they're able to do that, then, then maybe we can talk about land application of biosolids. But um, generally, we have to put pressure on the way that we're doing it now to make it so that the uh, environmental costs that are passed on to the society do not allow for the applicants to do it on their land and then we pay for it. We gotta, we gotta change the way we're doing it now. So unfortunately there's not a lot of great answers but I'll tell you what's not the answer, dumping it on agricultural land that goes directly into our watershed. Yeah, and, and if I could add to that, Shannon, um, you know, we need, to, as citizens, we all need to put a pressure on our elected officials. Um, the, since 2018, the state has been asking the utilities, hey, we want to invest in new technologies. Which ones do you want us to invest in? And the utilities are like, no, you know, we don't want to do this. And the reason is right now they have no liability. They put them on a truck and they, once they leave their property, their hands are clean. There's no liability. We need our county and our state elected officials to prioritize 
um, these new incentives because we are new technologies and investment in those because there's not a good answer right now. Um, we know what's the least impactful answer. Um, you know, some people are like, well, just put them into a landfill, but it's so squishy. That's not a long term answer because it's not good landfill material. Um, and so we we need to put pressure on every level of government to make it a priority for our state to invest in these new technologies. And quite frankly, let's challenge them to be the leaders on this. Let's get it right for the state of Florida um, to not only under, un, undo the damage that's being done, but protect for future generations. John and Lisa, I wanna ask this question from, from Nancy. Are we reaching out to middle and lower basin legislators to address that taxpayers are footing the bill for South Florida sewage sludge? Most definitely. We, we've been reaching out to them since 2018. Um, um, Senator Mayfield, you know, she's in the Melbourne area in the middle of it, in the upper basin. She included some of the incremental improvements in her Senate Bill 712 last year. Um, unfortunately, the utilities got in and undermined them a bit and provided and included some loopholes. Um, but she's committed on the record to continue to do more as well as other elected officials in those areas. So they're kind of torn like we are. They're like, well, this rule, this legislation, you know, there are some improvements, but more needs to be done. We're seeing that we can't wait on the legislature to do it all. We need to invoke the law and invoke good science to encourage them to do more and quite frankly, compel them to do more because they're not catching up. But yes, we're working with elected officials throughout. John, did you want to chime in there? Do you want me to go to the next question? Yeah, I, I, I just saw a question above that's kind of related. It's, it's how can citizens get involved? You know, I would, you know, based on what you learned today, the, the message is, you know, yes, we're, the, the incremental improvements included in the legislation are good, but contact your legislators and just make sure they know this does not fix the problem that the more there's more to be done and that anything that they can do to support the use of new technologies like i see jim did hemp for water and tony janicki's um new technology yeah we gotta try to do these things and until there's external pressure placed on these utilities to no longer do it the way we've been doing it there's no opportunity for change. And so that's really the best thing you can do and, and stand by because I think um, there's gonna be some opportunities when we do appear in court where we're gonna, it, there's, there's, there's dual purposes for bringing these lawsuits. It's not just to win the lawsuit, which hopefully we'll do, but it's also to draw attention to the nature of what this practice has done to our environment and hopefully gain, you know, uh, media coverage, but also the, 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 I hate to use the word, but anger of the fact that South Florida is coming up and dumping their poop in our backyards. And, you know, we have to do something about it. And that long-term solution is technology, but unless there's pressure put on current practices, we're never gonna get there. Lisa, do you want to chime in on either of these solutions that that um, uh, our two Jims asked about the Tony Janicki system or the hemp for water approach? I don't know if you have any background on either of those to chime in uh, and add to what John just mentioned. Yeah, I mean, I, I think I just want to underscore what John said. We have to put pressure because, I mean, there needs to be investment and whoever's getting the most pressure, you know, there's limited dollars, there's concerns about different things. But right now, you know, Governor DeSantis is talking about investing billions of dollars in resiliency and dealing with our sewage should be part of that resiliency effort because it can quite, you know, rising waters and temperatures can make all of these issues worse. Um, and, and so it is critical that we make sure that these new technologies are part of the equation. Um, I have seen the, the Janicki proposals. And in fact, that's what Senator Mayfield was advocating for in Brevard County. Brevard County was ready to do a pilot project, um, but that, that unfortunately didn't get any legs. And so we as citizens need to demand that they invest in these new technologies. And it's part of the long, long-term equation. Um, I just saw a question pop up from Seminole County. Yes, um, Senator Broder, is, is, he is very influential on this discussion. He is the Senate um, committee, the chairman of the Senate Environment and Natural Resources Committee. 
Um, and he would be great to hear from you, just letting him know, you know, this legislation's already passed through his committee, um, but he needs to understand this is just a first step, more needs to be done. And if you could underscore that information and you can find details on um, what to ask and some of the details from this conversation at stjohnsriverkeeper.org um, to help you with that email and we would appreciate that. Lisa and John, before we jump to um, our, our final segment where we talk about some things uh, uh, going on in the Middle Basin, I do want to, you know, highlight that in the Middle Basin, and sorry, I say Middle Basin, but I'm, I'm thinking Volusia County, Seminole County. Hi, is that Henry? Um, we've <laughs> oh, hey, <laughs> you're dark, so I didn't see it was a girl. Don't blame me. <laughs> um, um, but, you know, we've been talking a lot about um, septic tanks and the issue of septic tanks and the need to convert septic tanks to sewer. Um, and I think it, it's uh, uh, I think it's worth noting what's the connection between all of the septic to sewer conversions and then this issue of biosolids. We talked about whack-a-mole, but just sort of bring it all home so that we're all in the same message about what's going on here and the actions that need to, to take place. Well, and that's a great question. And it's a sad example of whack-a-mole because what's happening is we're spending hundreds of millions of dollars to take septic tanks offline. And so we're sending that sewage new to the wastewater treatment facilities. And then if we're removing the sludge and then putting it right back on the land adjacent to the waterways, in some cases, we're even seeing more runoff. And so you're just, you're just moving it around and another thing to remember is when you take it to a wastewater treatment facility, it's controllable. You can control where it goes. You can keep it out of the water, you can treat it. But when you put it in a truck and go spread it over land, all of a sudden it's not controllable. And what the state's saying, well, if now it's a, it's a, it's a runoff. And so we need to make sure we're controlling the pollution, stopping it at source, and not undermining all the public investment in removing septic tanks and other pollution sources. Thanks for that, Lisa. Um, and, and thank you, John, as well, both you guys for, for such um, excellent, excellent, timely and relevant information um, about an emerging issue in, in the watershed, um, uh, an emerging issue in, in the state of Florida. But I do want to give a few minutes to our Middle Basin uh, Outreach Coordinator, um, Gabby Milch. And Gabby, if you just want to kick us off with our next webinar and invite people to join us, and then I'll scan through to the next slides um, that cover some of our upcoming events and our partners events in the Middle Basin. Where did Gabby go? Is she here? Sorry for that, Gabby. If you're, I think, I think you may have jumped off right when, <laughs> right when you were going to start talking. I hope you didn't accidentally jump out. Well, let me just, uh, if Gabby comes back, that would be great. But in the meantime, I'll just go ahead and scroll through some of these um, upcoming events. Our next webinar is going to be on April 30th at noon, and we will be joined by our friends, the Friends of the Wakaiva, talking about some news coming in from the Wakaiva River. So um, please join us for our next uh, monthly Watershed Watch chat. Um, I also wanted to ask if anyone is interested in making your own rain barrel, specifically in the um, Lake Volusia Orange uh, Seminole County areas. We do have some rain barrels at our um, uh, Middle Basin office that we would be happy to, to do a workshop or um, you're welcome to watch this tutorial. And so just reach out to Gabby um, if, if you can. Um, if you can, Gabby just texted that her internet just cut off right when, right when she was supposed to talk. So I'm so sorry about that, but reach out to Gabby. Her contact information is here. If you want to do more to, to learn how to make a rain barrel. Um, I also wanted to tell folks about this upcoming Florida Gopher Tortoise Day that is being led by our friends, um, uh, at Split Oak. And so the Split Oak Forest, um, uh, area is going to have this event. So if you want to come out for Florida, Florida Gopher Tortoise Day, then please do that. And then, of course, um, John 
everyone, if you have any uh, final words here to say to say goodbye or to let people know that they can reach out to Public Trust for more information, go ahead and unmute yourself and you can uh, uh, do that now. Yeah, just real briefly, if, if there's ever anything that comes across y'all's desks that needs a, needs a lawyer to protect the environment, we're, we're, we're hopefully there for you guys. And so don't hesitate to reach out. Um, and, you know, Definitely stay tuned on this. This this is not done yet. Uh, I think it, 2021 is going to be a big year for protecting this resource. So we're excited for the collaboration. Thanks again. And with that, I want to thank everyone for joining us on our second Watershed Watch. Um, mark your calendar for next month where we talk about the Wakaiva River. And with that, um, I'll say bye to everyone. Thanks for joining us and see you all soon.